Hello, I am Dr. Kathleen Van Cleef from Durham University. And together with my colleague, Professor Neela de Meyer from the University of Oxford, I've developed the Oxford Visual Perception Screen, or OxVPS. OxVPS is a screen that uh, detects visual perception difficulties after a brain injury and is now available for clinical use. It takes about 15 minutes uh, to complete and it's all on paper format and it covers a wide range of tests for object perception, face perception, uh, visual inattention, eye-hand coordination and so on. So in this uh, series of videos I'll walk you through, explain a bit more of what it is, uh, how you administer it, how you score it and how you interpret the results. In OxCPS, um, patients can respond by answering verbally, but they can also respond by pointing to things. So we try to make it aphasia friendly and also make it friendly for people who have visual inattention or neglect, because we show all the images in one column. So even if they ignore one side of the space, people will still be able to see the images that are important for the test. So before we start doing all the tasks, we want to make sure that the patients are wearing the right glasses. So you want to check with them whether they're wearing their reading glasses or their very focal glasses. We also want to make sure that the lighting is okay, so that big lights are on or that they have a reading light if they need it. Patients can take as much time as they want with each of the tasks. Um, there are two tasks, the reading task and the cancellation task, that we time, but even there, they are allowed to take their time. They're also allowed to change their mind whatever they like. We only record their final answer. Each of the activities will need to be completed in the order as they are in the booklet um, and you are definitely allowed to give patients encouragement, um, definitely if they're not quite sure about something, just encourage them to have a guess and have a go. Let's have a look at each of the tasks. So the first one is the self-evaluation. In this task we ask people to give their subjective experience of their vision. So we ask them three different questions and they can answer verbally um, or they can use some gesturing, so they can for instance nod, shake their head or use a communication chart. It is important that you ask people how they experience their vision or changes in their vision since their stroke. And then you circle yes or no depending on their answer. Let's have a look at how it's done. Now, are you finding that you're having difficulty seeing with your usual glasses since you had your stroke? No, not really. And how about colors? Are you having any difficulty seeing color since you had your stroke? No. In the second task, the picture naming task, we show patients some black and white line drawings and we ask them, what is this a picture of? They're given five possible answers that they can choose from and those are printed vertically. They can just say the word verbally or they can point to what they think is the right answer. Generalizations like an animal, if it would show a dog, are not okay, so that would be incorrect. But if they use synonyms, that's okay. So if it would show a picture of glasses and they say spectacles, that's fine. So we usually let them respond in their own time, but it, if after a few seconds they don't answer, I would read out the words aloud. So let's have a look at this one. So we're going to go through this booklet here. I'm going to show you a picture. What is this a picture of? Mm, I don't know. Is it a pencil, soap, knife, pen, or scissors? If you don't know for sure, you can take a guess. A knife, maybe? Okay. In the third task, the semantic information task, we again show patients a picture, but now the question is slightly different. We ask them which of the words goes best with the picture. Again, they get five options and they can just say the word they think is best or they can point to it. If they don't reply within a few seconds, we will read the words out loud to them. Here we have this picture. Can you tell me which of these words goes best with it? Drinking, pub, beer, eating, or sandwich? Sandwich. Okay. The fourth task is the global shape perception. In that one, we'll show patients five different shapes, one at the top, four at the bottom, and we'll ask them which of the shapes at the bottom is most similar to the one at the top. They're not identical, but one of them is most similar. Again, they can point or they can say whether it's the first, second, third or fourth. 
if they say a number, it's usually quite good to just check which one they're actually referred to, because some people start counting from the top and others start counting from the bottom or from the second one down. Now, here we have some shapes. The shape here at the top, a little darker than these, but can you tell me which of these shapes you think is the most similar to the shape at the top? Mm. This one? Number one? Great. In the fifth task, item counting, patients see a page with stars on it and they have to count how many stars are on the page. Uh, they've again given five options to choose from. Uh, sometimes they'll say a number that's not on the page. Uh, in that case, I will just read out the options and ask them to pick one of those. Can you tell me how many stars are on this page? Six. Okay. So six isn't a choice. Oh, so okay. does it look like one of the numbers here? Three, eight, ten, seven, nine. Oh, it will be seven. Seven, yeah. Seven stars. In task number six, the simple feature task, we show people a straight line. And the line is either tilted to the left or the right, or is perfectly horizontal or vertical. And we ask people the question, is the line tilted? Some people get a little bit confused, and I might rephrase the question as, is the line slanted? So people can answer by just nodding yes or no, answering yes or no, or using their communication chart. Now here we have a line, it's a straight line, but is it tilted to one side? Yeah, it goes that side. Okay. In task number seven, the face recognition task, we show people a set of photos. One photo at the top, four photos below. And we ask them which of the photos below is from the same person as the picture on the top. They can point to it or they can say photo number one, two, three, four. If they say a number, again, it's best to check which one they are referring to. Which of these pictures here are the most similar to the picture at the top? They all look the same. Okay, they all look the same. Which one looks the best? This one, number one. In task number eight, that's a reading task, um, it's the last task in the booklet. We will ask patients to read a paragraph of text to us. Um, I usually allow patients to hold the booklet themselves so that they can hold it at the distance that works best for their classes. This task we time, so we start the timer as soon as they read the first word and stop the timer when they're finished. To score it, you circle any words that they omitted and strike to any words that they read incorrectly. In task number nine, that's a cancellation task, we move the booklet to the side and we give the patient some worksheets to do. The cancellation task has three pages, two practice pages and one with the real task. So for the practice pages, I'll give them the first one. I will explain to them that there are hearts on the page. Some hearts are complete and some hearts have a gap on the, either the left or the right side. Their task is to cross out all the complete hearts. So there's one example done at the top and then there's a column of hearts for them to practice on. If they make a mistake on the first practice, I'll explain it again to them to really make sure that they understand what they're looking for and let them have another go with a second practice. After the second practice, even if they still make mistakes, we'll move on to the real task. So that's a sheet with a lot of hearts on it. But the task is still the same. They have to cross out all the complete hearts. It's important that with all these sheets, the sheets are held at the midline of the patient. So not to their left side, not to their right side, but in the middle. So if they move it, you'll have to move it back to the middle. This task is timed, so you will start the timer as soon as they will start searching the page for hearts. And you stop the timer when they say they're finished. Some patients take a little extra time to look over to see if they've missed any. Um, but if so, you just continue the timer until they say they're finished. I've got them all, I think. Okay, yeah. finished? Yeah. The last task is task number 10. It's a figure copy task. So it shows a complex figure at the top of the page and I ask patients to copy that figure in the white space below. Often patients are doing this with their non-dominant hands, so I would sometimes say that it doesn't need to be neat if they're worried about doing this uh, very precisely. There's no time limit for this task. There's a shape, a figure here with lots of different things in it. Mm -hmm. And can you copy this figure in the white space beneath it? All of it? Yep. 
the whole thing. Now we'll show you how to score OxVPS. The first page you can score in real time when you're with the patient just by circling the answer they give you. But the second page needs a little more involvement. So we suggest scoring that after you've finished your session with the patient. So we'll go through the reading task. You'll be circling any words that the patient didn't say, and you'll be putting a line through words that they maybe mispronounced or made up their own word. And you'll be recording their accuracy for how many words they read out of 60. And you'll also be recording how many of the bold words they said, that's out of 10. You'll be timing this task. So for example, you'll see that it took 51 seconds for the patient to complete the reading task. You'll take 60 and divide it by the time taken. So that'll be 60 divided by 51. Then you multiply that by the accuracy. In this case, the accuracy was also 51, which gives you 60 words per minute as your score. When it comes to the cancellation task, again, you want to record the time when you're with the patient, but then you can score this separately. And you do that by dividing the page into two main boxes, A and B, you can see here on the form, and counting how many hearts they marked off in each of those boxes. Then you might like to circle the hearts that they will have ticked off that were uncompleted hearts. Then you enter how many hearts on the left side, which is A, and also the right side. In this case, the patient got three out of 12 hearts on the left side, and they got 10 out of 12 on the right. And they only circled one incomplete heart. You'll see on the worksheet C and D, we subtract that to get our object-based asymmetry, which is minus one. And then you subtract the B and the A as well, which we get number seven. In the figure copy, again, you wanna just notice what their strategy was. So first you can tick off what their strategy was. In this case, they did not start with the rectangle first. Then when you look at the elements present, there are 20 that you can see on the sheet. If you start by just counting all the sides of the rectangle and the line inside, you get seven automatically. And then you count each individual element. In this case, the patient got 16 and they were in the right location, those 16, and they were also drawn accurately. So they also get 16. Then you're just gonna multiply that by three, all those scores, to get the total score. And if they had drawn the large rectangle first, they get a strategy score point, but in this case, it was zero. When scoring OxVPS, you'll notice that each task has a cutoff score at the top. If the patient scores lower than the cutoff score, you'll be shading the wheel, which is on the very front of your examiner form. For instance, in the cancellation task, the space-based asymmetry was seven, which does not meet the cutoff, so we've shaded for that. Okay, so if now you've completed OxyPS, did all the scoring, you shaded your wedges, now how, how do we interpret all those results? Well. On the wheel, you have the names of the tasks on the outside. Inside the wheel are the names of a lot of different conditions. You can see that for some tasks, like the face recognition task, there's only one condition related to that, prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia means face blindness. So if you shaded that wedge, that means that your patient likely has some signs of prosopagnosia. And you might want to look into that further with some follow-up tests, or you might want to seek further advice. Other tasks have two little wedges associated with them. So for instance, if you look at a cancellation task, there is a small wedge for object-based neglect and one for space-based neglect. The reading task also has two different scores. And there's a score for Alexia, which is difficulties with recognizing words and reading. And there's a score for neglect dyslexia. So for Alexia, we look at the reading speed, so how fast people read. People with uh, Alexia will usually read a lot slower. Um, and neglect dyslexia, they will make mistakes with those bold words. And the bold words are either words that are very unusual, so low frequency words, or compound words, words that consist of two different parts, like firefighters. So people with neglect dyslexia might come up with different words. Instead of firefighters, they might say firemen. 
The figure copy task also has two different scores. There's a score for global attention. So we expect people to actually start by drawing the big rectangle first and then fill in the details. But not everyone does that. Some people pay more attention to the details and not really see the global structure. So they might start with drawing the star first or drawing uh, a diagonal first. The other thing we look at is a visual constructive score uh, and that is how many elements are present in the right location and accurately drawn. So if there's a low score on that, that means that people's visual construction is not quite accurate. So their coordination of eye and hand movements. Then if we look on the right side of the wheel, you can see that there are lots of errors there. So here there is no one-to-one -one relationship between a task and a condition, but we look at the profile of scores. So if, for instance, someone um, fails on the first two tasks and you've shaded the wedge for picture naming and the wedge for semantic information, you can see that that corresponds to the arrow that says associative agnosia. Yeah? So that person shows signs of associative agnosia and less so of the other conditions on that side, like apperceptive agnosia or simultan agnosia, for instance. In associative agnosia, people will be able to build up a picture and recognize shapes, but they won't be able to recognize a certain object. Um, optic aphasia, on the other hand, they will recognize the object, but they will not be able to put the name to it. So they will find it hard to do the picture naming task, while the semantic associations might still be intact. So they might still know what to use the object for, even though they can't come up with a name. People with apperceptive agnosia, they find it hard to build a picture. So they can see the lines, they can quite often see also whether the line goes to the left or to the right, or whether it's curved or straight. But combining all those lines into a picture of a house, for instance, they can't do. And if they can't build a coherent image, that also means that they obviously can't recognize it and can't name it. So they will find the picture naming difficult, the semantic info difficult, but they will also find the shape recognition difficult because they have to combine all these little lines into a shape and they can't do that anymore. People with simultanagnosia have difficulties with seeing more than one object at the same time. So the one that's most challenging for them will be the item counting. Um, because they might see one or two stars, but then the next second those stars are gone. And they might see another star, but they're not really sure whether they're looking at the same star that they were looking at as before. So counting the number of stars on a page will be very difficult, and they often underestimate the number of stars. However, they will also have difficulties with global shape, because they will have to compare the shape at the top to the shapes below, and they might not see all shapes at the same time, or not know where exactly they are in space. The same holds for the semantic information task. This is a task where they have to read all the words, and know all the words that are there. So if they can't see all the words, if they can't pay attention to all of them, it will be hard for them to solve that task correctly. If people fail all of the tasks on the right side of the wheel, um, that means they have severe visual perception difficulties, um, and that is likely an indication of cortical blindness. Um, if that happens, we will also have a look at what they said in the self-evaluation. So we asked them there about the subjective experience of their vision and they might say that they have vision problems but then it turns out that they're actually doing quite well. Or the opposite might happen, that they say they are fine, they have no problems but it turns out that in the tasks they show severe difficulties. So the last one, where they're not aware of having any visual difficulties, that's called Anton Babinski syndrome. And if people say that they can't see anything anymore, but it turns out that they still pick up certain things, they still have some unconscious vision left, that is an indication of uh, blindsight.